Can I say, first of all, thank you to Marlene for organising all this. Thank you for Innova to hosting all this. And a huge thank you to Lubaina for letting us do this. Because I said to her earlier, it's a bit strange to talk about somebody when they're sitting there. Any minute now, I'm going to say to her, does she take sugar? <laughs> it's a bit like that. So forgive us if we say things and your toes hurt. And please, please feel free to kick. <laughs> um, I want to say I've known Lubaina for... 30 years, yeah. yes, 31, mm -hmm. close, getting close. Um, and we met, or spoke, I should say, at the ICA, where she was showing freedom and change that you can see open in that booklet there. And we spoke about the dogs in the picture, and we thought about the dogs in terms of radical interventions into things. And we talked about the dogs as biting entities. And I think one of us said, let's keep biting and let's let our teeth stay in the leg. And that's actually what we need to do with Lubaina's work. Think about what it's about. I really only want to say a lot of general things about it and talk a bit via Plan B in order to say that. Um, but I wanted to begin by asking each of you, you don't need to answer at this spot, but during the day, how is it that you think about her body of work? It's a very extensive and inspiring body of work that ranges across a whole range of issues. It raises different political issues in different contexts. It works sumptuously and exquisitely with colour. It produces provocative installations and provides us a whole set of things to talk about. The question is, as somebody said to me in New York when I was looking at an exhibition, do you get it? Okay, do we get it? And what is it that we get when we get it? What is it that's got in Lubaina's work? What is it that's there? Um, on that kind of starting point, think about the ways that it has been talked about. In that exhibition in 1986-7 at the ICA, her work was put in a category called identity politics. Is that a category we still have? What would that mean in 2016? Identity politics then meant a whole set of different things in different issues. If you look at the illustrations where that's open, you'll see the debate about identity politics in 86, which was started by Sandy Nairn. Does it still have any bite, that context? Is it still relevant? Is it something we've discarded and why? When you get to the Tate Gallery website or the Contemporary Art website 2016, it still references identity politics in Lubaina's work. It talks about her contribution to painting and to the general change in painting in the late 20th century and early 21st century, but it talks about her sumptuous and sensuous painting. Now, has anybody talked or written about the quality of Lubaina's painting? What is the paint itself? What context would that be put in? And would that alter from 1986 to 2016? What words would you use to talk about it? And I'm cognizant of a wonderful writer called Maggie Nelson, who, if you haven't read her, please, please read her. She's magnificent. She asked at a recent talk, are words adequate for talking or for writing or for thinking? Because words depend, thinking, sorry, depends upon the words and the vocabulary we use, doesn't it? Our words come out of our thought processes and the things that we have read. So what do we have, what phrases, what words have we got that we can talk about in terms of Lubaina's work. Now, I just want to think about that in terms of the day, so just to kind of frame where we actually start. If you think about um, contemporary artists, their work's built on a complex whole baggage of comments, heard, spoken, written articles, read articles, scholarly articles, journalistic articles, visual references, in each of us visual bank that we have. Each of us will have a different visual bank that we draw on in relation to her work. And often the framing of the place in which the work is actually shown, that's actually crucial. The spatial visuality, before you even look at the work, what you bring to the work and what you think about the work. And when you get to the point of, have I got it? What have I got in here? It's completely, I think of the different spaces I've looked at Lubaina's work, art galleries, um, community centres, ICA, Tate, big exhibitions. Um, I first saw Thin Back Line by going quickly dotting into the ICA to go to the toilet. 
And I wept along and went, wow, that's interesting work. Oh, I'd love to come back <laughs> and went back and looked at it. So it was in a corridor. So do these spaces determine what it is that you see and how dependent is it therefore on the way those spaces are curated? Now let's think more about Lubaina herself in these contexts. Think of the work that Lubaina has done. She paints, she makes installations, she makes sound installations, she makes large scale installations, small scale installations, all of which contain painting and sculptural form, if you like to think that way. She's done curating, she's done writing, she does historical work, she does quite powerful work in organising conferences and bringing different kinds of people together to think about things. All that needs to be considered in the bag of today when we start thinking about her work and how that work is thought about and written about. So how Lubaynaud's work has been framed, I've already kind of raised that question. So freedom and change, as I said, was put in that initial context and freedom and change was put into a group of other artists' work in the identity, culture and power section and it was discussed very closely. In this section, an early address to the binarity of cultural forms was present. Do we still believe in binaries? Are binaries still part of our thinking patterns in a whole set of contexts? Them, us, us, other, probably not. They've broken down, but how and how do we move forward in those contexts to talk about Lubaina's work? In that exhibition, Lubaina's work was put in together with Sonia Boyce, Marlene's work, Donald Rodney, Keith Piper, etc., as you'll see there. So it was always contextualised along with other artists' work. Since then, she's done individual shows and individual work on her own, as well as group shows. So all these factors bear on how we think about the work and how we might want to sit and actually talk about it today. Um, the issue there, as I said, was identity politics and the inherent racism in the art world. Has that altered? Um, I teach American students and we were in the Tate and I had four black students in the group and two guards came up and turned us out because the black students were too close to the works of art. They only chose the black students and I objected they were allowed to come back. But even in the viewing context, there's a question of whether you can still say racism has died out, let alone the language that's actually currently used, the kind of inherent racism in the structure of our language, which Claudia Rankine has written very elegantly about, far more beautifully than I could ever kind of say. If you haven't read her, read Claudia Rankine, especially on microaggression, which is very powerful in that context. So to a large extent, this has altered by 2016 and the set of themes that are written about her work has changed too. The politics of change have shifted, as I suggested, and been enlarged, but they're kind of still there and the old binarity is still partly in play. Uh, now, as I said, move forward and think carefully. The Tate describes Lubaina's work <clears throat> which investigates historical representation of the people of the African diaspora and highlights the importance of their cultural contribution to the contemporary landscape. And as I said before, she's best known for her sensuous painterly rewritings of history, depictions of monuments where women are within moments, sorry, where women are within history and are active in determining change. Okay, these positions can be summed up in themes of cultural history and reclaimed identities. So where are we in 2016? Representations of the peoples of the African diaspora. Her work here in terms of mapping and remapping is interesting, productive, and clearly her contribution is extensive and exceptionally complex. That complexity, I hope, is something that we'll actually look at today. But is it now more a question of interconnectedness? that we should actually think about. Perhaps I'm thinking too much of Joe Cox, but I'm thinking of interconnectedness as an issue which is relevant here. How could we develop interconnectedness? My American students won't let me use the term Africa or even diaspora. They stand up and object in class. Africa is too tainted for them with Western imperialism. So I'm not allowed to use it. Diaspora is on the edge of taint for them. 
but we have to, I have to negotiate what I can say with them. I have to use the name of the country in its current formation. I mustn't use a past title or a generic Africa. So can we still use Africa? America has changed, whether that's under Obama, I don't know, but that's what they um, argue me, about to me. Um, think of Oluagube, quote, to attempt to secure an African identity would be to reassert a Western notion of who you should be. That suggests that that taint is, is there in his discussion and elsewhere he's written other things about it. Okay, as I said, surprisingly, it's only we, when we get to the Tate entry that it talk, that people begin to talk about the actual work and the form of the praxis of Lubaina. Who talks in length about her practice? We talk a lot about, I don't know, um, Bridget Riley's practice. We talk a lot about, uh, name me a woman artist. Their practice is extensively analysed and how their work actually develops. Has that happened with Lubaina's work? Odd little pickets, but not very many. Not a big extensive account of how that practice develops. Do any of you know her working processes? I'm sure you do, but <laughs> other people. Is that crucial? Do we need to know an artist's working process to look at the work? What about the sensuous quality of the paint? Where has she learnt that? Think of her training and what she did. I'm coming back to that in a, in a second. OK, so just think about what you know about how something is made, why she chose to make it look as it did, how she got it to look as it did, and what kind of work it's actually doing when it's made, when it's out there in the world. When something's out there in the world, it's kind of on its own, isn't it? It's got to get going with meeting up with the rest of us. But as it's being made, it's with Lubaina on its own, and it's in the process of making. One of my American students, who's a chemistry student, said to me, do you mean to say an artist starts with a blank page? <laughs> I said, well, kind of. <laughs> so we start with the blank page there. So what kind of work is this work made to do in the world? OK, now I just want to talk briefly about Plan B, which you see here. Um, this is the painting of the name Plan B, which gave the title to the exhibition, which was at Tate's and Ives in 1999-2000. The work was made in, I nearly said a lobster's hut, in a, <laughs> it's kind of like a lobster's hut, in, in a lifeguard's hut on the beach at St Ives. It was a tiny little space in which Lubaina worked. And she worked in that confined space and also in her studio in Preston. So the work is made at two locations, conceived and thought about in both locations. And it's made from sketches, thoughts, diagrams, drawings, and then produced, I think, in St Ives. And I think the length of the canvas has depended on the wall length in the lobster's hut. We now call it the lobster's hut. <laughs> in the lifeguard's hut, partly. No, because some there in two is, sorry, it's all right. Yes, you're right. Uh, OK. Um, Think about the title, Plan B, and the title of the installation as Plan B. It is Plan B as a notion, it's a complex work that braids together multiple strands of ideas with great fluidity and elegance in the setting out of both the installation and the individual works. The title can refer, can't it, both to the past, because you've discarded Plan A and you've moved on to Plan B. What is a plan B? OK, I know it's a rap artist, so you needn't tell me. <laughs> I know it's a club in Brixton, so you needn't tell me that. <laughs> um, do these, are these things important? Yes, probably. Complex strands, braided together with fluidity. They, they weld into it as well. But it's also about a past that's discarded and a possibility for the present. So it's hovering on a nice knife edge. It's something which is unstable and uncertain. It's the uncertainty that lies there. So the conveying of that idea through the installation is really quite subtly and complexly done. Um, I wrote about this at the time, and I quote myself, very embarrassing to do. Uh, so ambiguous and precarious in its references, the sheer speculativeness of the concept makes an uneasy, porous space with ill-defined and leaky edges, which also paradoxic paradoxically has the verb of renewal, the making of a new map. OK, renewal and maps. More about maps in one second. Uh, but thinking about it now, 
That's an interval of time happened here, 16. It's the unsettled that rocks through the installation. And might we not want to argue that unsettling definitions and reworking categories is not, the own, is not only the modus operandi of her painting, but also its subject matter. Uncertainty, undeterminedness, unease, dis-ease, diseased. Um, is that what's happening in the two works in the Tate? Ankle deep and between the two, my heart is balanced. Actually, I thought that was broken. Both of 1991, coming just after this. Okay, let's just come, I'll leave that with you and you can think about that. Uh, let's just come back to maps. I think one of the dominant themes in Lavena's work is maps. Everything is mapped. How do these maps work? Some of them are geographic. They refer to places. Some of them are historical. Some of them are speculative maps of what could be. Some of them refer directly to specific places. Um, there are maps of different kinds in titles, Revenge, which Dot's going to talk about. There's Venetian maps, which I'll show you in a minute, which is a map and a jigsaw puzzle. You can make your own map with the jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> I'm not worried by making a jigsaw puzzle. Jigsaw yes. puzzle of a painting. Mm -hmm. um, are they imaginary geographic connections? Are they actual spaces recalled by the titles, as in Venetian maps, which double as geographic maps and reveal hidden lives in the case of uh, Venetian maps, ceramicists, or those of the servants in naming the money? There's a kind of mapping in the plotting out of the installations. Her mind works with a kind of mappingness I would contend. You can throw that out, you don't have to agree with me. <laughs> uh, cognitive maps that contain paradoxes, query. Uh, just a few more possibilities arising from the installation plan B. It handles parallel double narratives, doubling, dislocation and violent interventions. Double canvases, different narratives, writing in one canvas and in parallel a painting. But are they parallel or are they different discourses? First of all, this is plan B, the painting which gave the name to the installation. It's a large painting which is now in Birmingham, still in Birmingham, Birmingham, lent by Contemporary Art Society. Go and see it, it's a wonderful painting. Um, you're looking at a confined space in which the work principally works. Look at the painting and look at the structure of the painting. It's a room, or is it? There are things which deny that actual structure of that space. There's a flattening because of this coming down. Sorry, that's a fold, I think, in the illustration. Um, you think you're in a space, but actually it's then quartered off into things, and then it's divided down into little windows. OK, there were little windows, and there still are little windows in the lifeguards outside St Ives. Tate, unless it's been incorporated in the building in the last few weeks, which is possible. Look out of the window. You see the sea, and the sea remains something which is there, which is dominant, and which is powerful. And that's another constant theme in Lubaina's work, the sea. It presses on many paintings. The concept of the sea presses. I think um, somebody, and I can't remember who, wrote an article last week on how um, Britons have forgotten the sea. Um, when I grew up, the sea was an absolutely terrifying thing. You thought of it as something that could encroach and overpower the country. OK, my grandfather was a fisherman, so maybe that's why I thought of the sea in those terms. So whenever he went out on a fishing trip, which was daily, um, it was always an anxiety, but the sea was omnipresent and somehow the channel has made us forget the presence and power of the sea until you go to your seaside holidays somewhere and then tsunami can happen. Waves can overpower you. You have to learn about currents and tides and those currents and tides are present there in a kind of pressure on that space. But currents and tides of what? Plan B or discarded plan A? Um, just look at the colour structure, because I won't say anything about that, because Marlene's going to talk about that, but look how it works. Blues of a somewhat threatening sea and this very black, dark space. Are these shadows, or has the sea encroached here, and is it about to go and we're gone as... Um, these are paintings from Plan B, and I'll just show you quickly so I don't run out of my time. Apparently long places, uh, canvases, two canvases put together to be an elongated space, but in every single one, every canvas in this exhibit, the sea is present. 
there's no nothing that I think that doesn't have the sea there. So it's possible that at any minute <coughs> the sea is going to engulf and click, click over these spaces. And always there's this spatial play. A big space, you think, and why has it got these diddy chairs in it and these diddy tables? Why are these small things there? Is it frailty? Those are extremely frail. And why is there something like a bookcase or a television table with doll's house size furniture on it? What's the scale of this? The scale and the pressure of the space and the psychological pressure of the water impinge on this space to make it feel dangerous. Again, please look at the colour carefully. You're going to talk about that. Look how the yellow here works. Apparently a complementary, but actually it's been made into a dissonance, and that dissonance is reflected in the floor here. Um, in other pieces, there are images along with texts, and the texts, um, you can read them in the article that you referenced there. All of them write and speak of danger, impending danger, the possibility of escape, the fears. Now, this is a Lubaina hardly ever talked about, Lubaina as a writer. What is a writer doing? Writing is a performative act, isn't it? Painting is a performative act. Writing is also a sound. It's a sound in the head of the writer and a sound in the head of the reader, which has inflections in the way in which they read something. So this image here, and indeed all the double paintings, you get the intensity of the writing the intensity of the sound of the writing set against an apparently calm room beside you, but there's the sea waiting to go and the blank space and your only escape isn't going to help you much because you can't clamber up it because there's nowhere to go. So there's this impendingness all the time happening in the... OK, I just want to show you this quickly. Um, this is Venetian maps. This was just to show you could look at the jigsaw puzzle. That here again is the sea waving through it and longitude and latitude and here are the ceramicists at the top referenced in relation to the water and the possibility of transport and drowning okay this is another piece from plan b and this is another part of lubaina that's very rarely talked about lubaina is fun she makes lovely jokes she's witty she plays with wit and humour in her work. I stood and looked at that and puzzled and puzzled and puzzled and puzzled. What the hell is that in that cup? Has somebody shot a wafer into a cup of coffee? My inevitable thought as a coffee drinker. Has somebody dropped something into a cup of coffee? But no, she told me after I asked her. It's her playing with tricks and puzzles from tricks. Books that show how to do tricks. And here she is with a very tiny piece which is related, small um, acrylic, which is related to plan B. As you can see, it's got the same spaces and the same water. But here's how the tricks actually work. Um, you fill this cup with water, this piece in it has got a hole in the bottom and the water comes out into the saucer and oh, there's no water left in the cup. She puts a lot of jokes into her work. We're not looking for them. Jokes and humour need discussion in her work by somebody. There's, there's humour even here. Okay. I don't know how many of you have been to Tates and Dyes, but you go in and there's a big atrium on a classical model. So you go into the atrium. Well, here you are in the atrium, but you aren't because it's a mirror. It's a, it's a hall of mirrors out of a fun fair almost, isn't it? What you see is not what you see. So this is again playing, her playing with, with the visuality and all that under threat from always the water ready to get you. Um, that humour can turn into wonderful, strong biting satire, as in Swallow Hard, the dinner service she did for judges' lodg lodgings. If you look carefully, each one of these plates has been, I would say, interfered with, been disrupted. The pattern on the plates contains an image put on by Lubaina, which shows the violence that's being done in different contexts. Here's an awful upper-class tosser being very sick <laughs> from what he's eaten, <laughs> having been served by a server there, and he's sticking it up. Uh, but that also says, Ugh, this is what we actually think about. This is her having fun again with us and making us think via humour. Where does all this come from? 
Um, just let me say one more thing about the sea. In terms of the sea, she's in, of course, strong company. She's always referenced historical works. Revenge, of course, references Turner's painting of Zong, the slave ship that went down. So his paintings of the sea are omnipresent. Maggie Hamling's images of the sea are kind of echoed in this work. But that turbulence that's present in Lubaina is certainly there from people like Maggie Humbling, and also in the tiny images in the smaller paintings, the long thin paintings in Plan B. Um, this is just to show you how the installation of Plan B also creates an instability. Okay, you think nice conventional kind of installation of work, but you look at that, it's a kind of cross channel, very right, isn't it? It disturbs the way in which you're reading it. Okay, you can focus at different levels and your eyes changing, but you're vertiginous gaze is disturbed by the way in which it's installed and the way in which you look directly at certain works. Um, let's just say two more things I think ought to be talked about today when we're thinking about what the Tate said about the sensuousness and the quality of her work. The wonderful thing about Lebena's work is her use of cutouts, often disparaged in the work. Why? There are very famous people who used cutout techniques up. And this is a remake by an American artist to show you that actually in the process of making a collage, Arp made disturbed surfaces as he made the work, bumping up and down in the work. Here is Matisse working in his studio, making those great last cutouts. But he worked on images, never mind the image for a minute, there's lots you could say about that. But he worked making huge scale images that hung on the wall, that, that it hangs down and stands on the floor. And in the recent Matisse exhibition, there was a slide, I couldn't find it on the internet, of one of those pieces actually standing. Those are cutouts. It's a strong modernist technique which Lubaina adopts. Um, I'm sure Christine will have more to say about the collage technique. <coughs> but collaging, cutting out, making, literally making as part of her practice, things from clipping and cutting. It needs talk. It's present, of course, hugely in Naming the Money, where all these large cutout figures of Naming the Money are each single standing. These are cutouts and they're full scale cutouts and they're still in that modernist tradition. So that needs talking about. And lastly, the thing that needs, Two things I want to say. Literally, I'll say them and then we can talk about them. What is all this? Remember Lubaina trained in theatre design. I think her work is intensely dramatic and intensely theatrical. I probed her with this before. She's looking fierce. How Brechtian is it? I don't know how much you know about Brecht and theatre, but Brecht theatre is a means of enticing you to look and then opening up what you're looking at to different interpretations which in his case are radical politics and in Lubaina's case that is certainly also true. These pieces, and I would have shown you the clip which you kindly put on the web uh, um, of Lubaina walking through all these pieces and I recommend people to look at it, it's easily easy to look at. You've got to engage with it, you've got to be the audience engaged with the piece and then you come away and you think about what it's about and actually, in Brechtian terms, you are changed. And the jokes, of course, are very Brechtian as well. You like this idea of sass, where you put humour into something in order to disrupt um, thinking patterns. Think Lubaina colour, and this is on to Marlene. Matisse is in her head. Bridget Riley is in her head. Lubaina should be in our heads. Thank you.